In this video, I'm going to show you the process of turning this design into this, a plant pot for an artificial fern. To begin with, it was off to my local wood supplier to pick up some hardwood. They had some nice Oroco, which is just what I needed, although the heavens did open up while I was there. Back at the workshop, the wood was cut in half, and as it was pre planed she'd be flat enough to put it straight through the thicknesser. I'd already cut out a test piece from plywood, which was used as a guide for how thick each piece should be. I wanted each board to fit really snugly into the slot. The boards were cut down so they could fit on the CNC machine. The pot was designed in Fusion 360 and comprised of a top and bottom with a series of slots that the ribs would fit into. The first parts to be cut were the simple ribs that made the main part of her body. Masking tape and CA glue were used to stick each board to the bed and then weighed down for a few minutes. The cut file from Fusion was loaded, then the tool height and the start point set. The 19 standard ribs needed. The wider stock gave 5 ribs, and the narrowest ones only 3. Using wider stock would have made the process much quicker, but you've got to work with what you've got. Quarter inch up cut bit was used for pretty much all of the parts. There's a bit of chip out, especially on the right angles on the ribs. Finishing pass with a down cut bit would have increased the quality, but things were taking long enough as it was. After being cut out, they're sanded and the champ threaded to the edges, which will come into contact with the slots to give a bit of clearance. Six support ribs were cut. These had an extra arm which would support the central ring. I set the start position pretty close to the edge with this one and only just got away with it. Some of the stock was twisted and needed to be flat in order to cut out the narrow ribs as we didn't have much material in contact with the bed. To surface it, old standy blades were put underneath the corners to shim it out and stop it rocking. Then it was flipped over to the side which had just been flattened, glued down and the parts cut. Top and bottom pieces were wider than the stock I had, so I had to do some glue ups. It was put through the thicknesser to remove the majority of the material and then put on the CNC to bring it down to finer thickness and make sure it's really flat.
The mortises on the rings had rounded corners from a quarter inch bit. I did consider chiselling it out, but it would take too long, so in the end I just ended up using a 1 8 inch roundover bit on the ribs instead. While the router table was out, the top and bottom parts got a quarter inch round over. Each rib was numbered and finessed with 180 grit on the orbital sander. To make sure everything went easily together on the final glue up, I just wanted a very light fiction fit. Next, the central ring was cut out. This would hold the actual plastic plant pot and be screwed to the support ribs. The bottom side was done first with holes drilled to allow cables to pass through and small holes for the screws. central hole was also added, so when the piece was flipped over it could be lined properly. The recesses in the ring allowed the support ribs to fit into it really precisely. Holes were pre-drilled into the support ribs using a dodgy combination of extension bits. Screws were then used to attach the central ring so it could be removed again if maintenance was required in the future. I needed something to conceal the LED driver and controller, so the 3D printer was dusted off and set to work. Fourteen hours later and it was done. I gave it a gentle sanding to smooth out the layer lines and give it a bit more of a matte finish. The pot was made up of 28 wooden pieces, and satisfying to see them all done, however I had two firm plants so I ended up making 56 parts in total. Everything was finished with Danish oil, with care given not to oil the surfaces at the end of the ribs where they'd be glued in. Uroko dust is harmful if you breathe it in. The CNC and dust extraction were loud, and the laser engraver can damage your eyes, so the PPE got a bit ridiculous at times. The glue up was pretty intense. There were 24 ribs to glue to the top and bottom pieces, with both surfaces getting glue. This ended up being 96 separate glue applications. The whole lot needed to then fit tightly together, both radially and vertically, before the glue started to go off. Some bank clamps and persuasive knocks with a mallet finally got everything in place. The glue squeeze out was cleaned up and then some weights put on top to leave it overnight. The 
next day the clamps came off and everything felt nice and solid. One rib hadn't been glued in, but instead was screwed in at the bottom. This was to allow the central ring to be inserted and aid by wiring it up. I managed to find some LED strips online, which had the LEDs on the side of the strip instead of on the face. This was perfect for fitting within the channels in the central ring. They came with a silicon shroud, presumably for water resistance. However, the strips weren't attached to the shroud and rattled around loosely in there. This looked bad and can't have helped with heat dissipation, so it was peeled off. There was no adhesive tape on the strip itself, so I ordered the same double-sided tape that the LED strips usually use. The strips were then cut up and the tape applied. I got some 2mm thick aluminium bar, cut it to the right lengths and then hammer formed it into the right curve to fit within the central ring. The capped on tape was added to the end of each to prevent accidental shorts. Once all the pieces were ready, they were soldered together in situ and glued into the central ring. The LEDs and the Shelly Wi-Fi controller used less than an amp in total, so a 1.5 amp power supply was used to give a bit of overhead. A cable with a female Fig8 connector was used to connect to the power supply, and a bit of old strain relief from a plug was used to make sure it didn't get dislodged. The top and bottom rings were put on separate channels on a Wi-Fi controller so they could be controlled independently top needing about 60% of the power of the bottom to give an equal brightness. The cable joining the bits of LED strip on the bottom of the ring had to be just the right length. Too long and it would poke out the bottom of a ring, and too short the screws wouldn't be able to get past it. The top LED strip was held in place by just friction, which meant it could be removed in the future to give access to the screws underneath. And with that, the whole lot was done.